Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering peripheral nerve disorders as well as spinal cord disorders. If you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And guys, don't forget the content that I cover here on YouTube is going to be different than the content you see me covering on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. So be sure to check me out on those other social media platforms platforms as well. Uh, don't forget to check out my podcast, Nexus Nursing, as well as my website where I have audio lessons available for you, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Do I? Oh, yes, I do. And I also have my Tumblr dice for sale on the website, guys. On the Tumblr, I have, you know, important text clues, uh, repetitive text to know, um, blood compatibility, all that good stuff on my Tumblr guys check it out and support me um the best way you can support this channel though guys is to share my content i've gotten so many emails um emails direct messages from you know students who watch me that pass their boards and they say thank you you helped me pass if you really want to thank me share my content share my content on your social media platforms to help um my channel grow okay guys without any further ado let's get started first question when assessing a patient with newly diagnosed trigeminal neuralgia, the nurse will ask the patient about A, triggers that lead to facial pain, B, visual problems caused by ptosis, C, appetite, poor appetite caused by loss of taste, or D, decreased sensation on the affected side. And guys, the correct answer is A, triggers that lead to facial pain. So trigeminal neuralgia, guys, and obviously this is where the trigeminal nerve is affected, the patient will have severe, excruciating pain on that side of the face where that nerve is damaged, either the left side or the right side. But let me tell you, when I tell you excruciating pain, patients often um, describe it as they feel like someone took a knife and is stabbing them in the face. And little things such as a kiss on the cheek or them chewing or air wind blowing in that direction where the cheek is, something as simple as that can cause them to have that extreme pain. So you're going to assess. What is assessment? Getting information. You're going to ask that patient about what are the triggers for pain, okay? Um, by the way, guys, ptosis, loss of taste, decreased sensation, these are not characteristics of trigeminal neuralgia. And also trigeminal neuralgia is also known as tic de la rue. All right, next question. During assessment of the patient with recurrence of symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia, the nurse should A, examine the mouth and teeth thoroughly, B, have the patient clench and relax the jaw and eyes, C, identify trigger zones by lightly touching the affected side, or D, palpate, gently palpate the face to compare skin temperatures bilaterally. And guys, the correct answer is A, examine the mouth and teeth thoroughly. Why? Well, in question, the first question we just did, I told you the simple act of chewing or someone kissing them on the cheek or them drinking, just that simple act is enough to trigger that excruciating pain where they feel like someone's taking a knife and stabbing them on that side of the face. So often what happens is the patient will be afraid they will be afraid to chew their food thoroughly because they'll be afraid of triggering that type of pain. So they'll end up pocketing food on that side. Now think about it. What happens to food that just sits there? Bacteria grows and before you know that patient can have an infection, that bacteria can creep from their mouth before you know they got a lung infection. We want to prevent all of that and plus aspiration. Lots of things can happen from that. So you're going to do a, a very careful examination and inspection of their mouth and teeth. Something else that's a trigger, guys, is them brushing their teeth. The simple act of brushing their teeth can bring on that pain. So the patient may not even brush their teeth the way they're supposed to. So again, add pie. What's the first thing in add pie assessment? You need to assess your patient. Next question. When the nurse is planning care for a hospitalized patient who is experiencing an acute episode of trigeminal neuralgia, an appropriate action is to A, teach O. Oh, Guys, let me go back. Let me go back to the question we just did because, you know, I talked to you about the correct answer, but I want to talk to you about the wrong answer choices. So I'm going to go back a little bit. That question that we just did, 
So yes, uh, A was examine the mouth and teeth thoroughly, wonderful. But look at these other answer choices. Having the patient clench and relax the jaw and eyes, that can trigger the pain. Identifying trigger zones by lightly touching the effect. It's if I just told you that a simple gush of wind can be enough to trigger pain, don't you think that's going to trigger their pain if you touch that side of their face? So that's not the answer. And then um, D, gently palpate. Stop it. So choices B, C, and D are all triggers to the pain. You are not going to do that. Now we can move on. When the nurse is planning care for a hospitalized patient who's experiencing an acute episode of trigeminal neuralgia, an appropriate action is to include A, teach facial and jaw relaxation techniques, B, assess intake and output in dietary intake, C, apply ice packs for no more than 20 minutes, or D, spend time at the bedside talking with the patient. I think by now you're getting a pretty good IG idea of everything that's going on with trigeminal neuralgia. The answer is going to be B. Assess their INO. Assess their dietary intake. Why? Because they will be afraid to chew. They will be afraid to take sips of water because they're scared of triggering that pain. Right? Whenever you guys get test questions asking you about priority, your priority is always going to be the patient's physiological status. Anything that keeps that patient alive. Ding, 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 ding. Nutrition. Ding, 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 ding. INO, fluids and electrolytes. Nutrition, uh, glucose, uh, vital signs, ABC. Um, what am I missing? Um, he, hemodynamic status, right? All of those things, guys, is what is physically keeping that patient alive. So whenever... Excuse me. Whenever you're being asked about a priority, it's going to be what's keeping that patient alive. And that's going to be a priority. That patient's I and know their nutrition, that's going to be our priority, okay? Choices A, C, and D, again, will cause pain to the patient. Teaching them uh, facial and jaw relaxation techniques, having them do anything with the jaw might trigger a, a painful reaction. Putting anything on the face, e including ice, or making them talk. That's another thing with patients with trigeminal neuralgia. They're scared to speak because when you're speaking, what's moving? Your mouth, your jaws, your lips, and any of that can be a trigger for the patient to have that pain where they feel like someone's stabbing them in the face, okay? So that's why B is the correct answer. Next question. When teaching patients who are at risk for Bell's palsy because of previous herpes simplex infection, which information should the nurse include? A, you should call the doctor if pain or herpes lesions occur near the ear. B, treatment of herpes with antiviral agents will prevent development of Bell's palsy. C, medications to treat Bell's palsy work only if started before paralysis onset. Or D, you may be able to prevent Bell's palsy by doing facial exercises regularly. And guys, the correct answer is A, you should call the doctor if pain or herpes lesions occurs near the ear. Why? This is a sign and symptoms of what? Bell's palsy, guys. And as soon as that patient has those symptoms of Bell's palsy, we want to get them high dose corticosteroids immediately because that is going to help um, shorten the duration and to uh, decrease the effects of the Bell's palsy. So that's why um, we're going to ask them that question. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. B, treatment of herpes with antiviral agents will prevent the development of Bell's palsy. No, it won't. It absolutely will not develop the, um, excuse me, it will not decrease the patient's risk for it. That's false. C, medication to treat Bell's palsy works only if started before paralysis onset. That is false. And what did I tell you about all inclusives? What did I tell you about never and only and always? Do not choose that answer unless you know that you know that you know that you know. But beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's the correct answer. And that is false. The fact that you saw only should have gave you a clue that this is false. Even if it started um, after the onset, it still can help. So that's false. And then choice D, you may be able to prevent Bell's palsy by doing facial exercises regularly. That is a lie. That is not true. So the only true statement here is A. 
okay you should call the doctor if pain or herpes lesions occurs near the ear again guys that's a symptom of the bell's palsy and we're going to try get that patient high dose corticosteroids immediately A patient with Bell's palsy refuses to eat while others are present because of the embarrassment of drooling. The best response by the nurse to the patient's behavior is A, respect the patient's desire to arrange for privacy at mealtimes. B, offer the patient liquid nutritional supplements at frequent intervals. C, discuss the patient's concerns with visitors who arrive at mealtime. Or D, teach the patient to chew food on the unaffected side of the mouth. And guys, the correct answer is A, you're going to respect the patient's desire and arrange for privacy at meals time. So remember, guys, um, Bell's palsy, this is where the patient will have um, weakness or paralysis on one side of the face where the facial nerve has been damaged. So that patient will kind of look like, you know, a stroke patient where they have that facial drooping on just one side of the face. That's what they, that this patient will have. They have weakness or paralysis just on one side of the face where the facial nerve has been affected. So A, we're going to respect that patient's desire and arrange for privacy during meal times because what is most important to us the patient's physiological integrity what is keeping that patient alive and one of the things that falls under physiological integrity is what nutrition we want to make sure that that patient is getting adequate nutrition and they already told us they're embarrassed so you think they're going to be eating in front of people you think they're going to be drinking fluids in front of people no now let's look at the wrong answer choices b offer patient liquid nutritional supplements at frequent intervals that's not going to be adequate that's not enough nutrition, okay? C, discuss the patient's concerns with, have you ever heard of HIPAA violation? And D, teach a patient to chew food on the unaffected side of the mouth. Well, they're still gonna be drooling and they're concerned about the drooling. So even if they chew on the unaffected side of the mouth, what about the drooling that they have on the side of the face that, they're par that they have that facial paralysis? right? So you're going to respect their wishes, give them privacy to make sure they're eating and drinking appropriately. Next question. A patient with Guillain-Barre syndrome asked the nurse what has caused the disease. In responding to the patient, the nurse explains that Guillain-Barre syndrome A results from an acute infection and inflammation of the peripheral nerves. B is due to an immune reaction that attacks the covering of the peripheral nerves. C is caused by destruction of peripheral nerves after exposure to a viral infection. Or D results from degeneration, degeneration of the peripheral nerve caused by viral attacks. And guys, the correct answer is B. It's due to an immune reaction that attacks the covering of the peripheral nerves. So what happens is that myelin sheath becomes damaged and it interferes with the conduction of the nerve impulses. Okay, choices A, C, and D are absolutely false. Those are not the causes of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. A 24-year-old patient is hospitalized with the onset of Guillain-Barre syndrome. During this phase of the patient's illness, the most essential assessment for the nurse to carry out is A, monitoring the cardiac rhythm continuously, B, determining the level of consciousness every two hours, C, evaluating sensation and strength of extremities, or D, performing constant evaluation of respiratory function. And guys, the correct answer is D. The most important thing in the stage is checking their respiratory function. Why? That's the most serious complication. Think about it. Do we care about anything else if that patient's dead because they couldn't breathe? So the most important and the most dangerous, the most deadly complication of Guillain-Barre is, you know, the respiratory system being depressed or not functioning adequately. So that's um, what we're going to be. That's what's going to be our priority. Now, let's look at the other choices. Um, the cardiac rhythm, level of consciousness, sensation and strength. Yes, these are important assessments, but they're not as important as respirations. Okay. When caring for a patient who has Guillain-Barre syndrome, which assessment data obtained by the nurse will require the most immediate action? A, the uh, patient the patient complains of severe tingling pain in the feet. 
B, the patient has continuous drooling of saliva. C, the patient's blood pressure is 106 over 50. Or D, the patient's quadriceps and triceps re reflexes are absent. And guys, the correct answer is B, the patient has continuous drooling of saliva. Continuous drooling of saliva. So they're not what? They're not swallowing adequately. What can they do? They can aspirate. Hello, ABCs, breathing. We're concerned about that patient aspirating. That is going to be our priority over anything else on the list because do we really care about anything else on this list if our patient's dead because they couldn't breathe? Okay. All right, next question. A patient who has numbness and weakness of both feet is hospitalized with Guillain-Barre syndrome. The nurse will anticipate that collaborative interventions at this time will include A, intubation mechanical ventilation, B, insertion of an NG tube, C, administration of solumedra, or D, IV infusion of immunoglobulin. And guys, the correct answer is IV infusion of immunoglobulin. This patient's going to get high dose, high dose immunoglobulin. That's going to help decrease the extent of this and the severity, okay? Now, choices A and B, the intubation, mechanical vent uh, ventilation, insertion of the NG tube, that may have to be done later if this progresses not progressives, if this progress says, right? But at this stage of the scenario presented to us, it's the IV infusion immunoglobin. We want immunoglobin. We want to give them high dose as soon as possible. Choice C, administration of sol sol solumedrol, that's not gonna do anything to decrease the symptoms that the patient's experiencing right now. So guys, the correct answer for this is choice D. A patient with a neck fracture at the cervical five level is admitted to the ICU following initial treatment in the ER. During initial assessment of the patient, the nurse recognizes the presence of spinal shock on finding A, hypotension bradycardia warm extremities, B, involuntary spastic movements of the arms and legs, C, presence of hyperactive reflex below the level of injury, or D, flaccid paralysis and lack of sensation below the level of injury. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is D, flaccid paralysis and lack of sensation below the level of injury. Something else you're going to see is decreased reflexes and decreased sensation, okay? Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices. Um, choices A, B, and C, you may see these happen, but you're going to see them later as the disease progressive. Why do I keep doing that? as the disease progresses, but not this early stage of the game, okay? When caring for a patient who had a C8 spinal cord injury 10 days ago and has a weak cough effort, bibasilar crackles, and decreased breath sounds, the intervention by the nurse should be to A, administer oxygen at 7 to 9 liters with a face mask, B, place the hands on the epigastric area and push upward when the patient coughs. C, encourage the patient to use a synthesis barometer every two hours during the day. Or D, suction the patient's oral and pharyngeal airway. And guys, the correct answer is B. You want to place hands on the epigastric area and push upward when the patient coughs. Why? You want to help that patient's coughing efforts to do what? Mobilize those secretions. Get those secretions out. Go back to the question. It says that the patient has a weak cough. That cough is weak. You think they're going to be able to push up secretions? How do we know they have secretions? Let's keep going. By basal or crackles. When you hear crackles, what does that mean? Fluid is present. Is there ever supposed to be fluid in the lungs? Absolutely not. Okay, and they have decreased breath sounds. Uh, yeah, because they got fluid in the lungs. So what you want to do is help them cough it up. Now let's look at the other choices. A, administer oxygen, seven to nine liters with a face mask. That oxygen is not going to help them cough up the secretions. And there's nothing in this question that tells us the patient's hypoxemic. Okay. What we know is that they've got secretions, they've got crackles, and we need to help them cough them up. Choice C, encourage the patient to use incentive spirometer every two hours um, during the day. Again, guys, our priority is to help them 
cough up the secretions. And since this barometer is wonderful, it helps the lungs expand, but we need them to cough up those secretions. And because the patient had that C8, even those muscles to help that patient cough are going to be weak. Choice D, suction the patient's oral and pharyngeal airway. We may end up having to do this, but your first priority is to help them cough it up. And if that doesn't work, then you're going to have to suction the patient. But your first priority is to have uh, help them to cough up those secretions. Next question. A patient with a patient with paraplegia, you guys know I can't speak. Paraplegia, paraplegia, you see that word, resulting from a T10, that's the thoracic, okay? A T10 spinal cord injury has a neurogenic reflex bladder. When the nurse develops a plan of care for this problem, which nursing action would be most appropriate? A, teaching the patient how to self-catheterize. B, assisting the patient to toilet every two to three hours. C, use of the crede method to empty the bladder. Or D, catheterization for residual urine after voiding. And guys, the correct answer is going to be A, teaching the patient how to self catheterize. Remember guys, the bladder is spastic. So it's not even going to empty out until it's been what? Overstretched. And the last thing we want to even take a chance of is what? A, bla a ruptured bladder, right? We don't want to do that. That's why you have to um, catheterize the patient intermittently. Now let's look at the other choices. B, assisting the patient to the toilet every two to three hours. Okay, you're helping them go to the toilet, but that's not going to empty the bladder. You have to actually catheterize that patient. C, use of the crede method to empty the bladder. No, that's for a flaccid bladder. And choice D, catheterization for residual urine after voiding, that is not going to resolve this issue that we have of that urine remaining in the bladder. So what we're going to do is catheterize that bladder intermittently. A patient with a history of a T2 spinal cord tells a nurse, I feel awful today. My head is throbbing and I feel sick to my stomach. Which action should the nurse take first? A, notify the patient's healthcare provider. B, check the uh, blood pressure. C, give the order antiemetic. Or D, assess for fecal impaction. And guys, the correct answer is B, check the blood pressure. Guys, we see um, a, a situation where the patient has a spinal cord injury and now they have a headache. First of all, even without a spinal cord injury, just a regular headache, someone has a headache. What's the first thing you, you know, one of the first things going through your mind? Um, have you checked your blood pressure? Because what are we worried about that blood pressure being so high? They're about to what? Have a stroke. But this patient has a spinal cord injury and a headache. You better be suspecting autonomic dysreflexia. We're concerned with that blood pressure, so you better take that patient's blood pressure. Now, let's look at our other choices, guys. One, notify the patient's healthcare provider and tell them what? What the patient said, you haven't even assessed them yet, right? So you're gonna assess the patient, then make a call to the doctor. Choice C, give the ordered anti-medic. Well, guys, you're only gonna do that after autonomic dysreflexia has been ruled out. So patient has um, nausea, we need to make sure that the nausea isn't because of the autonomic dysreflexia. So we gotta make sure that's been ruled out. That's why you're assessing the patient. That's why you're taking their blood pressure. Lastly, assess for fecal impaction. Yeah, you can do this after checking the patient's blood pressure and making sure that it's not autonomic dysreflexia. The nurse is caring for a patient who's being evaluated for possible metastatic spinal cord tumor. Which of these data obtained when assessing the patient requires most immediate action by the nurse? A, the patient has new onset weakness of both legs. B, the patient complains of chronic level six pain on a 10 point scale. C, the patient starts to cry and says, I feel hopeless. Or D, the patient expresses anxiety about having surgery. And guys, the correct answer is A, the patient has, <gasps> ding, 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 new onset. Guys, 
a new onset of anything bad is our priority. You're running to that patient. New onset of weakness of both legs. What are we suspecting? We're suspecting spinal cord compression. You are running to that patient. That's your priority. The other patients that have anxiety and pain and, and all of that, that can wait. None of those are life-threatening. But guess what? Spinal cord compression is life-threatening. Okay? We're running to that patient. This is a medical emergency. Oh my goodness, guys, we're already down to our last question. All right. In which order will the nurse perform the following actions when caring for a patient with possible cervical spinal cord trauma who's admitted to the emergency department? Here are your choices. Administer oxygen using non-rebreather mask, monitor cardiac rhythm and blood pressure, immobilize the patient's head, neck, and spine, and transfer the patient to radiology for spinal CT. Okay, guys, this is the order. This is the priority that we're going to do things. The first thing you're going to do is C. You want to immobilize the patient's head, neck, and spine. Why? You want to prefer, prevent further damage to the patient. So that's the first thing you're going to do because you don't want to cause further damage and cause that patient to even be paralyzed because you are doing a nursing intervention without immobilizing that patient's head, neck, and spine. So that's the first thing you want to do, okay? The second thing you want to do is give them oxygen in, via non-rebreathing mask. You want to make sure they get 100% of that oxygen, right? The third thing you want to do is B, monitor for cardiac rhythm and blood pressure. Why? We want to make sure the patient does not develop what? Neurogenic shock. And lastly, you're going to do D. You're going to transfer the patient to radiology for spinal CT. You want to determine the extent of the damage. So that is the order that you're going to do things. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, if you want to see more videos like this, please be sure. Leave me a comment below and let me know, Professor D, I need you to make more videos on this topic. And I will make sure I add it to my list to keep them coming your way. If there's something else that you'd like to see me cover, please leave it in the comments. Guys, please do not forget to like this video, subscribe below. Please support my channel by sharing my content. Please share my content with classmates shared on your social media platform so more people can know about me and watch these videos and i can help more people guys thank you so much for watching and you'll see me on the next video